Are there any senators in the chamber that wish to vote or change their vote? On this vote, the yeas are 22 and the nays are 76. Under the previous order requiring 60 votes for the adoption of this motion, the motion is not agreed to. Madam President. Majority Leader. I ask for unanimous consent. We proceed now to a pre morning business. Senators allowed to speak for up to 10 minutes each until 6 o'clock this afternoon, this evening. Without objection, Senator from Vermont is recognized. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, I am offering today a resolution to amend the United States Constitution. I do not do this lightly, nor have I ever done something like this before. The U.S. Constitution is an extraordinary document which has served our country well for over 200 years, and in my view, it should not be amended often. But in light of the disastrous Supreme Court's 5-4 to four decision in the Citizens United case, I see no alternative but a constitutional amendment. I should add that a similar resolution has been offered in the House by Congressman Ted Deutsch of Florida. This constitutional amendment is supported by such grassroots organizations as public citizens, people for the American way, and the Center for Media and Democracy. Madam President, let me go on record as strongly as I can and as clearly as I can in stating that I strongly disagree with the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision. In my view, a corporation is not a person. In my view, a corporation does not have First Amendment rights to spend as much money as it wants without disclosure on a political campaign. In my view, corporations should not be able to go into their treasuries, spend millions and millions of dollars on a campaign in order to buy elections. I do not believe that is what American democracy is supposed to be about. I do not believe that that is what the bravest of the brave from our country fighting for democracy fought and died to preserve. Madam President, almost two years ago, <clears throat> in its now infamous Citizens United decision, the United States Supreme Court upended over a century of precedent, taking a somewhat narrow legal question and using it as an opportunity to radically change our political landscape, unleashing a tsunami of corporate spending on campaign ads that has just begun. Make no mistake, the Citizens United ruling has radically changed the nature of our democracy, further tilting the balance of the power toward the rich and the powerful at a time when already the wealthiest people in this country have never had it so good. In my view, history will record that the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision is one of the worst decisions ever made by a Supreme Court in the history of our country. While there is no way of knowing for sure, since there are no disclosure requirements in place to track what was spent, it is no secret that already in the 2010 midterm elections, corporations and some very, very wealthy individuals spent a huge and unprecedented amount of money to further their political goals. And there is no question that this is just the beginning of their efforts. At a time when corporations have over $2 trillion in cash in their bank accounts and are making record-breaking profits, the American people should be concerned when the Supreme Court says that these corporations have a constitutionally protected right to spend, spend, spend shareholders' money to dominate an election 
as if they were real, live persons. There will be no end to the impact that corporate interests can have on our campaigns and our democracy if we do not end the Citizens United decision and its impact on our nation. All of us in the Senate share one common characteristic. We all run for elections. We all live in the real political world. And let me just speak for a moment what I think many of my colleagues in their heart of hearts know to be true. And that is that while the campaign finance system we had before Citizens United was, in my view, a disaster, there is no question that a disastrous situation where candidates, members of the Senate, spend huge amounts of time having to raise money, and I know that is distasteful not just for Democrats, it is distasteful for Republicans, it is distasteful for an independent. That's what we do. And now, as a result of Citizens United, that bad situation has become much worse because infinitely more money is going to come into the political process through non-disclosed donations suddenly appearing on TV screens in our states. According to an October 10, 2011 article in Politico, quote, the billionaire industrialist brothers David and Charles Koch plan to steer more than 200 million potentially much more to conservative groups ahead of Election Day 2012. What do we think? Do we think that American democracy is about a couple of wealthy billionaires putting hundreds of millions of dollars into campaigns without disclosure? Is that really the democracy that Americans fought and died for in war after war? I think not. And it clearly is not just Republican operatives. There will be Democrats doing the same. So more and more money comes into the system. We don't know where it comes from. And in order to defend ourselves, candidates are going to have to raise more and more money, become more and more dependent on big money interest. Does anybody really believe that that is what American democracy is supposed to be about? And let's talk about the practical impacts. What happens here on the floor of the Senate? Madam President, the six largest banks on Wall Street have assets equal to over 65% of our GDP, over $9 trillion, six banks. Now, when an issue comes up that impacts Wall Street, some of us, for example, think it might be a good idea to break up these huge banks. And members walk up to the desk up there, and they have to decide, am I going to vote for this, am I going to vote against it, with full knowledge that if they vote against the interests of Wall Street, that two weeks later there may be ads coming down into their state attacking them. Every member of the Senate, every member of the House, in their back of their minds will be thinking, gee, if I cast a vote this way, if I take on some big money interest, Am I going to be punished for that? Will a huge amount of money be unleashed in my state? Everybody here understands that that's true. It's not just taking on Wall Street. Maybe it's taking on the drug companies. Maybe it's taking on the private insurance companies. Maybe it's taking on the military industrial complex. But whatever powerful and wealthy special interest you are prepared to take on on behalf of the interests of the middle class and working families of this country, when you walk up to that desk and you cast that vote, you know in the back of your mind that you may be unleashing a tsunami of money coming into your state, and you're going to think twice about how you cast that vote. Madam President, I am a proud sponsor of a number of bills that would respond to Citizens United and begin to get a handle on the problem, and I'd like to acknowledge them very briefly. One is the Disclose Act, sponsored by Senator Schumer, which would force corporations spending money on campaign ads 
to disclose their identity, just as candidates have to do. That is a good thing. I support it. Another is the Fair Elections Now Act, sponsored by Senator Durbin, which would move us finally to publicly financed elections. I think that is a very good idea. I support that. Third piece of legislation is a recent resolution for a campaign finance constitutional amendment introduced by Senator Tom Udall of New Mexico that would make it clear that Congress and the states have the authority to write laws to regulate campaign spending across the country and make sure our state and federal elections are about what's right for our democracy. And I support Senator Udall's resolution. But even these excellent pieces of legislation are not enough. Madam President, the Constitution of this country has served us well for more than 200 years. But when the Supreme Court says that for purposes of the First Amendment, corporations are people, that writing checks from the company's bank account is constitutionally protected speech, and that even attempts by the federal government and states to impose reasonable restrictions on campaign ads are unconstitutional, when that occurs, our democracy is in grave danger. Something more needs to be done, something more fundamental and indisputable, something that cannot be turned on its head by a 5-4 Supreme Court decision. We have got to send a constitutional amendment to the states that says, simply and straightforwardly, what everyone except five members of the United States Supreme Court seem to understand, and that is corporations are not people. Bank of America is not a person. ExxonMobil is not a person. Madam President, the resolution I am offering today calls for an amendment to be sent to the states that would do just that. It would make perfectly clear, one, corporations are not persons with equal constitutional rights as real life flesh and blood human beings. Two, corporations are subject to regulation by the people. Three, corporations may not make campaign contributions, which has been the law of the land for the last century. And four, Congress and states have the power to regulate campaign finance, as Senator Udall's amendment would also say. Madam President, this amendment is co-sponsored by Senator Begich of Alaska, and I would urge all of my colleagues to co-sponsor this amendment, which in fact does what its title suggests, saves American democracy. Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President. Senator from Florida. Madam President, I want to thank the Senator from Tennessee for his graciousness to let me uh, make just a few very brief remarks. I wanted to call to the attention of the Senate that there are some good things that are happening in Medicare. Uh, Madam President, uh, there are in the health care bill, which was a very complicated piece of legislation, there are a lot of good things. There were some things that are implemented over time that if the mistakes have been made, we can uh, correct those mistakes as they are starting to be implemented. But I want to point out some of the salutary things that are happening under the new health reform bill with regard to Medicaid. It was just this week that the agency that runs Medicare, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, announced that more seniors and people with disabilities on Medicare are seeing significantly lower cost for important health care because of this new law. What we're seeing, for example, is for the first time Millions of Americans are now, that are on Medicare, are now getting free physical exams as part of preventive medicine. And because of the donut hole, which is that complicated uh, uh, black hole that senior citizens would fall into when they were getting assistance for their uh, prescription drugs, 
Well, lo and behold, that donut hole is being filled by the federal government assisting them in paying for those drugs, and therefore they're getting uh, a lot more of their drugs uh, without having to pay for them. For example, nationwide, it's over two and a half million uh, people on Medicare have saved more than a billion and a half dollars in their prescriptions. And if you boil that down to my state of Florida, you've got 172,000 Medicare recipients that saved $96 million, which is an average for the senior citizen in Florida of $563 per person per year. Uh, in the case of the physical exams, you have over 24 million people in the country that now have already taken advantage of having one of these free physical exams in order to help with the preventive health care aspects that the bill was aimed at. And in my state, with a, a lot of senior citizens, that's uh, close to two million senior citizens have taken advantage of those physical exams. And then, remember how when we were discussing this, all was doom and gloom about Medicare Advantage? Well, what's happened to Medicare Advantage? We had to change it because Medicare Advantage before, under the previous law, had a 14% bump over and above Medicare fee-for-service. And the federal government was going to go broke if we didn't do something about that. And where was that money going? It was going to the insurance company because Medicare Advantage is a fancy term for Medicare given through an insurance company, an HMO. And so what has happened, if you look all across the country, in Medicare Advantage, enrollments are up and the premiums that senior citizens pay are down. Look at the state of Florida in this last year. Enrollment was up by 6%. Premiums decreased by about 10%. What's happening now in 2012? Enrollments are up almost 20%, and the premiums are going down by a whopping 26%. So that means more seniors are going to have access to higher quality care while paying less. And it's a win, win, win. It's a win for clearly the country that we are leaning out all of that excess bumps. It's clearly a win to the senior citizen. And in the process, uh, the uh, insurance companies are giving better quality care. Madam President, I wanted to bring this to the attention of the Senate, and I do thank my colleague from Tennessee for the generosity of him allowing me uh, to make these comments prior to his. Madam, Madam President. President. <clears throat> Senator from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Madam President, and I thank the Senator from Florida. Madam President, we hear a lot about tax breaks, tax loopholes around the United States Senate. I want to talk about a tax loophole today, a big one. It's on its way out. It's a $23 billion tax loophole. And it's not a loophole in the tax code of Washington, D.C. It's a loophole in virtually every state in the country. It's a loophole that prefers some taxpayers over other taxpayers. It subsidizes some businesses over other businesses. And it's a loophole that, because of that, caused tax rates in states to be higher and it costs states to have less money to fund the universities or the state parks or the schools or the other expenses that are legitimate in the operation of a state. I say it's a tax loophole that's on its way out because after 20 years, uh, Senator Enzi of Wyoming and Senator Durbin of Illinois have combined with a piece of legislation that is rare in Washington, D.C. It is only 10 pages long. It is very simple. It's a state's rights piece of legislation that gives each state the right to decide for itself whether or not to collect its state sales tax from everybody who owes it. Whether that person buys a pair of cowboy boots in Nashville 
or whether it buys a pair of cowboy boots from Amazon online. Senator Enzi and Senator Durbin introduced the, the Marketplace Fairness Act uh, four weeks ago. It had four, well, five total Republican sponsors and five total Democratic sponsors. I am one of those sponsors. This is the bill that solves the problem of the online sales tax loophole, the one I described a little earlier. I mentioned cowboy boots. Let me describe what I'm talking about in practical terms. I called the owner of the Nashville Boot Company a couple of weeks ago. His name is Frank Harwell. He sold boots online, and he sells them uh, to people who walk into his store there in West Nashville. When he started the company, almost all of his boots were sold online. Here's what he says is happening to him today. People come into the cowboy boot company in Nashville, and they try on cowboy boots. And they find a pair they like, and then they go home and buy the cowboy boots online in order to save the state sales tax. Now, they owe the sales tax. Many people don't know they owe it, but they owe the sales tax just as much if they had bought the boots uh, at the bookstore, I mean, at the cowboy boot store there in Nashville. But they don't pay it. And why is that? It's because under the state law, when Frank Harwell sells a pair of cowboy boots in his store in Nashville, he collects the sales tax, sends it to the state. But under the law, the Supreme Court said 20 years ago, the state of Tennessee or the state of Missouri or the state of Washington, any other state, couldn't require Amazon or an out-of-state seller to collect the same sales tax. They had a reason for doing so, and it was a good reason. They said that it was so complicated to do it that it put a burden on interstate commerce. But at the same time, the Supreme Court invited the United States Congress to fix the problem. And by fixing, pro fixing the problem, that means the Congress could act in order to create a fair way for states to require retailers who are out of state to collect the same sales tax that retailers on Main Street collect. Over that 20 years, the online sales tax loophole got to be a big loophole. It subsidizes some businesses at the expense of others, and as I said earlier, prefers some taxpayers at the expense of others. Last week, the Hudson Institute, a generally conservative organization, released a new report that explains how <clears throat> the subsidizing of out-of-state sellers works and how the federal government, those of us in Washington, are keeping states from closing this loophole. They conclude, Hudson does, that this online sales tax loophole is distorting the marketplace, and I urge my colleagues to take a serious look at the Hudson Institute report. Governors and legislators are up in arms because they're, bring, they're being deprived of the right to enforce their own sales tax law. Uh, this is a little different loophole, actually a little worse one. Usually, loopholes are written into the law. Those are the kind we're trying to change in our tax reform proposals in Washington. This is a tax that's already owed. This is a tax that's already owed that governors and legislators want to collect. And they're used to pay for the things that states need to pay for or to reduce a tax. Or in the state of Tennessee, which has a very high sales tax, if, we, if the state was allowed to collect sales tax from everybody who owes it, well, then we might postpone the day of a state income tax, which, is, which are probably the three most hated words in tax vocabulary in Tennessee. I said when Senator Enzi and Senator Durbin introduced their bill that I believe they had solved the problem and that if I were an out-of-state retailer or an online retailer, I would begin to make plans to collect that sales tax just as Main Street collectors collect it today. And many have, for example, Amazon, uh, which had opposed for a long time this kind of legislation because in their view, it was too uncomplicated for them to figure out what the tax might be, changed their mind and said that the NZ Durban bill is a good bill and Amazon supports it. That's not all. Mississippi Governor Haley Barber, strong conservative Republican governor, chairman of the Republican Governors Association, 
wrote a letter on November 29, and I'd like to quote it. Quote, in the early days of the Internet, Governor Barber said, the complexities of collecting state sales taxes across thousands of state and local sales tax jurisdictions were major obstacles. The technology simply didn't exist to expect startups to comply with the various tax compliance rules in every part of the country. But today, e-commerce has grown, and there's simply no longer a compelling reason for government to continue giving online retailers special treatment over small businesses who reside on main streets in Mississippi and the country. Governor Barber continues, the time to level the playing field is now as there are no effective barriers to complying with state sales tax laws. Now here's what Governor Barber is saying. 20 years ago, we didn't have the kind of software and information we do today. But if, if I want to know what the weather is in Maryville, Tennessee, where I, I live, I just put in weather and my zip code, 37886. Under this new bill and under the technology that exists today, states will be required to give to out-of-state retailers or online retailers the software that will permit them to do the same thing. If I order a pair of cowboy boots, well, they can put in my name, the cost of the boots, uh, the zip code, and the software will compute the tax and even uh, find a way to send it on to the state. It'll be just as easy, or maybe even easier, for the out-of-state retailers to collect the sales tax that's owed as it will be for cowboy boot store selling it out of the front door in Nashville. The National Governors Association sent a letter last week saying that the NZ Durban bill represents a quote common sense approach that will allow states to collect taxes they are owed, help businesses comply with different state tax laws, and provide fair competition between retailers that will benefit consumers, unquote. Last week the Judiciary Committee in the House of Representatives held an oversight hearing to discuss all three bills that have been introduced to reduce to address this issue and there was a lot of good discussion. I want to share a few things that were said and I hope we can have a similar hearing in the Senate uh, soon. Mike Pence of Indiana, one of the leading conservatives in Congress, a fellow who knows a tax when he sees one, said, quote, I don't think Congress should be in the business of picking winners and losers. Congressman Pence continued, inaction by Congress today results in a system that does pick winners and losers. Congressman Pence also talked about something I want to make sure my colleagues understand. The NZ Durban bill is not talking about taxing the internet. It's not talking about creating a new tax. As far as the internet access tax goes, the Senate debated that a few years ago. I was in the middle of that debate and I was in the middle of the solution that imposed a moratorium on the internet access tax. That law is still there. We're not talking about an internet access tax. Neither are we talking about a new tax. We're talking about the plain old state sales tax that already exists. And it's very hard to imagine how anyone can say collecting a tax that's already owed is a new tax. Governor Barber and Congressman Pence are correct. 20 years ago, the technology didn't exist. Today, it does. About the only ones complaining are the taxpayers and businesses that enjoy being subsidized by other taxpayers and other businesses, and that, in our opinion, is not correct tax policy. As Republicans, I believe our party should oppose government policies that prefer some taxpayers over others or some businesses over others. As Republicans, I believe we should support states' rights. And our bill does that by giving the state the right to make this decision do, about how to collect taxes. Do you want to collect taxes from everybody who owes the tax, or do you not want to? Do you want to prefer some businesses, out-of-state businesses over in-state businesses, or do you not want to? Uh, do you want to collect the tax and reduce tax rates or spend the money on services? That's up to the states. These sentiments are also shared by William, the late William F. Buckley and Al Cardenas, chairman of the American Conservative Union. Ten years ago, uh, William Buckley, who many people see as the father of the modern conservative movement, wrote in the National Review, quote, the mattress maker in Connecticut is willing to compete with a company in Massachusetts, but doesn't like it 
if the out-of-state businesses are in practical terms subsidized. And that's what the non-tax amounts to. Local concerns are complaining about traffic in mattresses and books and records and computer equipment which ordered through the internet come in, so to speak, duty free. That's William F. Buckley. And then Al Cardenas, the chairman of the American Conservative Union, a distinguished Florida citizen, um, uh, the head of, a, of an outfit that's uh, arguably as strong and influential as any conservative organization in Washington, said in his recent essay, quote, there's no more glaring example of misguided government power than when taxes or regulations affect two similar businesses completely differently. Madam President, as I've said many times before, I believe that Enzi Durbin legislation solves the problem. I believe it's going to happen. I hope that out-of-state sellers and online sellers will move ahead to work with states to make voluntary agreements, as, for example, Amazon has in Tennessee, and begin to allow states to enforce their tax policy properly. Our bill is a remarkable feat in Washington, D.C. I've mentioned it before. I'd like to emphasize it again. It is only 10 pages long. It is only about allowing states to make a decision about whether they want to close a loophole, a tax loophole. It's about stopping the subsidization of some taxpayers over others. It's about stopping the subsidization of some businesses over others. I'm glad others are starting to share this view. And as more senators learn about the Marketplace Fairness Act and look at the options it gives each state, I hope and I believe we'll have more co-sponsors. 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, the bills that were introduced weren't adequate to solve the problem. Fortunately, today, Senator Enzi and Senator Durbin have solved the problem. I agree. Democratic senators agree. The chairman of the American Conservative Union agrees. The chairman of the Republican Governors Association agrees. Congressman Mike Pence agrees. It is a matter of marketplace fairness. Mr. President, Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to have printed in the record the letter that, to which I referred from Mississippi Governor Barber, a letter from the National Governors Association and the National Journey, Journal article published last week regarding the House Judiciary Committee hearing on this subject. Without objection. Madam President, I yield the floor and I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Thank you.